With this video, I want to continue our discussion of linguistic anthropology by looking specifically at linguistic diversity. Now we know that within a group of people who speak a single language, individuals in that group are going to use language differently. And that, that difference, that variation, happens in a lot of ways. We know that geography impacts the way that people use their language. So for example, we have different accents and different dialects based on where we grew up. We know that in the United States, we speak English differently than people in England or in, in Australia. Uh, but we also know that in the United States, there are tons of different accents, right? Even just here in New York, we might have different accents between the different boroughs. So we can see that geography and the, the communities that you're raised in have a really strong effect on how we use the same language. We might also see language differences between generations. So someone who's older might have different vocabulary or different styles of speech than someone who's younger. And of course, we're going to see language variation between men and women. Men and women use language differently, often because we have different goals that we're trying to achieve. And so we're going to see differences in communication styles between genders as well. Sociolinguistics is the field that studies the relationship between social variations and linguistic variations, and this is a major chunk of linguistic anthropology. Now, linguistic variation always exists, and it has always existed throughout time. Linguistic variation is also what produces language change. So we know that languages are constantly changing. Just like our bodies, just like culture, language is constantly changing as a part of the social group that it exists within. Now, when certain variants of language are associated with positive social factors, meaning when there's some sort of prestige attached to one style of speech or one accent or even one particular word, we can see how other members of the group pick up on that variation and it becomes spread throughout the wider community. Now, one of my favorite examples of this, it's a bit dated, but if we look at Snoop, right? Snoop is an influential rapper, artist, and and you know, influencer, um, and has been for decades at this point. About 20 years ago, um, all of a sudden there was this moment in America where everyone, and I mean everyone, it didn't matter who you were, where you were from, how old you were, everyone started saying fashizzle, right? It was just commonplace, fashizzle this, fashizzle that, izzles everywhere. And this is a great example of how positive linguistic variations uh, can spread throughout a community. And it's actually, it's pretty stupid math, but I love it. The idea is essentially people were looking at Snoop and saying, okay, well, Snoop is cool, right? We all know that Snoop is cool. Snoop says for shizzle. Therefore, if I say for shizzle, I will be cool like Snoop. It's really dumb math, but it's the math that we do as we as humans are trying to attain these, these positive um, social valuations. So that's how language um, and language variations spread throughout a community, and that causes language to change over time. Now, we can also see language variation in a particular situation we call a diglossia. Diglossia means two tongues. Di means two, gloss means tongue in Latin. A diglossia exists when, within a language group, there are high and low variants of that particular language, or high and low dialects. Now, the high variant is the one that people typically consider to be proper. People consider it to be educated. It's the type of language that's used in the professional world. It's used in universities. It's used in law. It's used in politics. It's used in media. So it's considered to be the right way to speak the language. However, there are also low variants. Low variants are more, um, you could say, community-based variants of language. It's more casual styles of speech that we use with our friends and our family. But often these low variants are considered improper or uneducated. Um, so, you know, we all kind of have this idea that there are certain ways that we're supposed to speak in certain settings, and maybe we have different ways that we talk with our friends, but we just know that we're supposed to, to perform linguistically differently in other situations. Now, the idea that there are these high and low variants of language really dovetails into our basic um, you know, understandings that we have about how societies work. And I'm not trying to say that this is right. I'm not trying to say this is how society should be. I'm simply stating this is how human societies have been working for a very long time. We use certain indicators of a person's character 
to indicate something about themselves. So we're really talking about the use of extra layers of symbolism that we put onto other aspects of being human. Language is one of those places where we add extra layers of meaning based on how people use language. And this is something that has existed for centuries and we can see it coming up in, you know, in popular culture. So I want to show you a little clip from a movie called My Fair Lady. This came out in the 1960s, but it's based on a play that was written in the early 1900s. In this movie, a young woman has a very like working class accent. And this linguistics professor has decided that he's going to teach her to speak proper English so that he can pass her off into high society. Pickering, this is going to be ghastly. Show yourself, Higgins. Give the girl a chance. Oh, well, I suppose you can't expect you to get it right the first time. Now, come here, Eliza, and watch closely. Now, you see that flame? Every time you pronounce the letter H correctly, the flame will waver, and every time you drop your H, the flame will remain stationary. That's how you'll know if you've done it correctly. In time, your ear will hear the difference. See it better in the mirror. Now, listen carefully. In Hartford, Hereford, and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. Now, repeat that after me. In Hartford, Hereford, and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. In Hartford, Hereford, and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. Oh, no, 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 no. No ear at all. Shall I do it over? No, please. We see in this clip how he's trying to demonstrate what he considers to be the proper way of speaking. And she is then repeating this phrase in the improper way. And he's absolutely exasperated by it, right? Because he lives within a system where a person's social class can be identified based on their styles of speech. But I want to again focus on the idea that the style of speech that she is using, her particular accent, her particular dialect, it matches up to this other social characteristic, which is her socioeconomic status. And we see this same plot device used in tons of movies, right? We've got all of these movies where we see that something about a person indicates that they are from some sort of lower social class, and maybe it's even just popularity. Um, but movies like Can't Buy Me Love or She's All That or Love Don't Cost a Thing, you have these characters who need to be uh, you know, need, in quotes, need to be elevated out of their uncoolness uh, by someone who has that higher social standing. And part of that elevation out of uncoolness involves a makeover. Because just like language, our clothing indicates, or we believe it indicates, something about who we are as people. Now, I mentioned that these high and low variants, we all sort of just naturally understand that there are ways that we're supposed to speak in certain situations. But Every single dialect that we use, every single variant that we use is equally effective at communication. Otherwise, we wouldn't use it, right? And so the, per the preference that we have for one dialect over another in any given situation, that's entirely based on social judgments. It's entirely based on social valuations. There's nothing about the high dialect that is actually better. It's not a better version of a language. It's not a more complete version of a language. It's just the style of language that we as a society have assigned to represent that proper style of speech, okay? And most of us, we move back and forth between these different variants on a constant basis. This is called code switching. We are constantly code switching. Um, and that just simply, we can see it, you know, we don't talk to our professors necessarily the same way that we talk to our best friends. We don't talk to our grandmothers the same way that we talk to our kids. We understand that in society, we can modify our styles of speech based on the situation that we exist within. But that doesn't make one variant any better than another. Now we can extend this, uh, this look at high and low language variants into gender. What we see is that women in America throughout history have been more careful to use high or prestige dialects. And this is very likely a result of sexual politics throughout American history. Um, 
for most women in the United States and around the world, there's been little upward mobility, um, meaning that if a woman is born poor or in a lower socioeconomic class, there haven't necessarily been opportunities for women to improve their own station, to improve their own um, socioeconomic status just through their own hard work, right? Uh, education, opportunities to start businesses, those weren't necessarily available to most women throughout the majority of the history of this country. And so for many women, there may have been a resource, there may have been value in using high variance of language as a way of presenting themselves as members of a higher socioeconomic class. So essentially, if a woman wanted to improve her lifestyle, maybe her best option would be to marry someone from a higher socioeconomic class. And if you're going to marry into a higher social class, then you need to be able to linguistically perform according to the norms and the values of that higher social class. It's kind of a fake it till you make it situation. Men, however, have a little bit more flexibility when it comes to uh, the language variants that they can use. And for a lot of men, using low variants of language actually carries a lot of social status. And that's because low variants are typically associated with masculinity. They represent a working class background. They represent growing up tough. For some people, it's, you know, trying to demonstrate that they like, they've got, you know, street cred or something. And so using those low variants is a way of asserting masculinity, which we know is a very highly prized characteristic amongst men in the United States. We can also see how men and women use language for different purposes. And this is based on a, a theory developed by linguist Deborah Tannen. She said that women attempt to use language to build rapport with each other, whereas men use language to report to each other. So when we say building rapport, this means that women often use language with each other as a way of connecting. We try to form and nurture these interpersonal relationships with one another, essentially building networks. Men, however, use language more often to sort of check in on each other's um, social status and, and fit each other into a hierarchy. And you can even see how this happens in terms of body language, right? When women are talking to each other, we often face each other. We, we look into each other's eyes. We, we do a lot of that verbal sort of mirroring. So if a girlfriend's talking, we go, uh-huh, uh-huh, yep, okay, right, I get it. And we're signaling, I'm here with you, I'm listening to you, keep going. Men don't do this typically. Uh, if two men are having a conversation, they don't typically turn toward each other and, you know, touch knees and look into each other's eyes and say, you know, well, what were you feeling and how do you think about what you felt? And it, men tend to sit side by side and both face in one direction because they're not necessarily looking to build that relationship in, you know, a tight network. It's more about figuring out who is this other person in relation to me. Language ultimately has what we call symbolic capital. That means that we use language to make judgments about other people. And with that knowledge, with the knowledge that other people can use language to make judgments about us, we can modify our styles of speech and essentially use language like money. So capital in this sense refers to value and we really can spend language like we spend money. We all in our society sort of agree that there are some styles of speech that carry higher value and some styles of speech that carry less value. And what's really interesting is that even for people who don't have access to that high value linguistic style, they will still agree that that style has value. Um, so it's the same way that we deal with money in the world today, right? It's like, I don't have money, but I see that someone else does. And so I agree that that money still has value. Whereas I could say, well, you know, it's all a made up system. It's the whole thing is made up. But that's because language can be used as a resource. And language takes on the characteristics of the people who use those particular styles. And we also see this um, as a way of sort of uh, gatekeeping. We can use language, we can use variants of language, we can use um, even slang to sort of figure out who's in our group and who's not in our group. And when we use things incorrectly or when we use a language variant in the wrong place or the wrong time, um, not only does it not signal that we're you know, not doing something appropriate linguistically, it's a big red flag to say this person doesn't belong, this person doesn't get it. 
right? And I think a great example of this would be memes. We've all seen memes. Uh, these, you know, little pictures with words that go all around the internet. We know that there are right ways to do them and wrong ways to do them. And maybe we can't even verbalize what the right ways are, but we know when something's wrong. And when something's wrong, we go, this person, they're not an insider. They're not cool. They're not a part of our group. So language carries a lot of extra levels of meaning to it. The last thing I want to talk about is a very particular case of linguistic diversity in the United States, and that is this particular variant of American English called African American Vernacular English, AAVE. It's also been called Black English Vernacular, or in the more sort of, you know, colloquial way, uh, Ebonics. Now, AAVE is a distinct linguistic variant of American English. And there are tons of variants of American English. But just like all of those other variants, AAVE has its own linguistic rules. It has phonological rules, meaning there are certain ways that you're supposed to say certain things in AAVE. It also has grammatical rules. And this is a really important point because often when people hear the word ebonics, um, this idea comes to mind of, you know, a really unstructured, unrule based linguistic style that's, you know, improper, it's uneducated, and it says it has a negative connotation to it. Um, but that negative connotation is purely a value that's been given by the society it exists within. There is nothing less rule-based about AAVE than any other variant of American English. Most AAVE speakers are bidialectical, meaning that they code switch between AAVE and Standard American English, or SAE. So perhaps we might see that this is an example of a diglossia. Now, one particular moment in American history um, when people became, really became aware that this was a linguistic variant that had been defined was in the 1990s. So AAVE AAVE had been defined as a linguistic variant in the 1970s, and no one really cared, right? It was something that academics talked about, um, but it was like, okay, that's fine. So we know that people have different styles of speech in different places, whatever. In the mid-1990s, however, it entered the popular discussion of Americans because the Oakland school system um, made a very bold move. They noticed that a disproportionate number of the black students in the Oakland school system were failing on the standardized tests for reading and writing, and they were being pushed into special education programs. And, you know, when a student gets, uh, gets routed into special education, it can be very difficult to mainstream them back into the, uh, the regular classroom. So, Oakland recognized that something was going on with their black students and that they were not really not getting access to all of the educational materials that they that they needed that they were supposed to have. So Oakland went about a very thorough investigation. Why was this happening? Right. And what they ultimately understood was that the majority of their black students were AAVE speakers. AAVE was the variant of English that was being used at home and in their communities, but then they were coming into school and they were being taught by non-AAVE teachers, predominantly being taught by white teachers who only spoke standard American English. And they were being tested in standard American English. And so they were being tested and evaluated in a variant of English that they were not at that moment fluent in. Oakland decided to, uh, to essentially call AAVE a second language. And they applied for federal funding so that they could get teachers and resources into the classroom that would be appropriate to help that transition, teaching from AAVE into standard American English. And this is a practice that has been used around the world to great success multiple times. However, when America found out that Oakland school system wanted to get resources in AAVE, all they heard was Oakland wants to teach black English in school. Um, and everyone lost their minds. You know, a lot of people were critical of the, of the program saying that it was a way of keeping black students educationally segregated by preventing them from using standard American English and therefore preventing, you know, further opportunities in life. And then, of course, you had, a, you know, groups of white parents who were just so terribly worried that their precious, innocent white children were going to be taught how to speak black English. And, you know, what was the world coming to? 
It was a fundamental misunderstanding of the goals of the program and also the history behind this type of education that works with the, the language of fluency to mainstream into the standard version of the language. Um, what this example showed us, though, was that language is never just about language, right? This really wasn't a debate about language. This was a debate about race. Language is never just about language because there are all of these other social factors that are put on top of it. Now I'm going to include some links in the description below, some videos about AAVE instruction and about what AAVE is, the fact that it's not improper English, it's not broken English. And I'm also going to include some links to a more recent um, episode in American history where this debate kind of came back again, where it was less about the words that someone used and more about how they use them. And that is regarding the testimony of Rachel Jontel in the trial of George Zimmerman. So Rachel Jontel was Trayvon Martin's friend. She was on the phone with him while he was shot. Um, and she testified at the murder trial of George Zimmerman. And what happened though through that was that she really got put on trial um, for her linguistic variant for the, the style of speech that she used. And it's a really interesting case that shows us that, you know, even though this, this episode in the, in the 90s in Oakland was 25 years ago, but as a country, we haven't fully moved on from that. We're not divorced from the idea that language codes or carries other social meanings that are still very, very um, relevant for us today. So check out those videos in the description below, and that's going to be it for linguistic diversity.